Hello and welcome back to Fulcrum Entertainment and our audiobook of Resident Evil Caliban Cove. If you want to find the start of this audiobook or you want to listen to any of our other books here on the channel, go into the description below to check out links to our playlists. If you want to subscribe and join the illustrious Knights of Fulcrum, my friends, go ahead, click that red button, and then click that bell icon along with it, so you know every time one of our audiobooks comes out. Thank you for being patient while we took a break from Resident Evil last week to celebrate Star Wars Day. But we return again, and I'm here to chat to the guys in the comments, as always, starting with a few people. Murphy Tremble, thanks so much for joining us, Murphy, says this is seriously impressive. You're a very talented storyteller. I hope you keep it coming. Sorry for the uh, gap in them, but we are keeping it going. Thank you very much, Murphy. And Darth Gamer. Thank you very much for commenting on the video, Darth, who says, This book is surprisingly comedic for a book about a mad doctor perfecting a zombie virus and releasing it into the world. I've never been a big fan of zombies, so I've never had much interest in Resident Evil. However, with this book, you have certainly peaked my interest. Thank you very much, Darth. Thank you for taking a risk on something that you maybe wouldn't normally listen to. I really do hope that the risk pays out and you enjoy our book. I'm certainly enjoying it. So let's get on with the business of reading, and I will start this week with Chapter 6. Karen Driver was a tall, lanky woman in her early 30s, with short blonde hair and a serious business like demeanour. Her small home was spotlessly kept and almost antiseptically clean. The clothes she picked out for Rebecca were utilitarian and perfectly folded. A dark green t-shirt and crisp matching pants, black cotton socks and underwear, even her bathroom seemed to reflect her personality. The white walls were lined with shelves, each neatly organised according to a purpose. Scratch a forensic scientist... Find an obsessive compulsive. Rebecca immediately felt guilty for thinking it. Karen had been welcoming enough, even friendly in a brusque way. Maybe she just hated clutter. Rebecca sat on the edge of the toilet and cuffed the overlong pants around her ankles, relieved to be out of her old clothes and feeling surprisingly clear-headed after a night of broken sleep. David had rented a car at the airport, and in the early hours of the morning, they'd found a cheap motel and a staggered into separate rooms. Rebecca, too exhausted to do more than take off her shoes before crawling into bed. She woke just before ten, took a shower, and had been waiting nervously when David knocked at her door. Rebecca heard the front door open and close, new voices floating through the living room, she slipped on her high tops and laced them quickly, feeling her anxiety level jump a notch. The team was assembled. They were that much closer to going in, and though she thought of little else since waking up, the realisation continued to come as a kind of shock. Umbrella's surprise attack on Barry's house already seemed like it had happened in another lifetime, though it had only been hours ago. And hours from now, this will all be over. It's what's going to happen in between that worries me. David and his team weren't there. They didn't see the dogs, the snakes, the unnatural creatures in the tunnels, or the tyrant. Rebecca shook the images away as she stood up, scooping her dirty clothes off the floor and stuffing them into the empty bag that she carried on the plane. There was no reason to assume that the Caliban Cove facility would be the same, and worrying about it wouldn't change anything. She paused in front of the mirror, studying the tense features of the young woman she saw there, and then walked to the door. She headed for the living room, past the sparkling kitchen, and around a corner in the hall. She heard David's lilting voice, apparently summing up the events of the night before. Said he'd ring some of the others first thing this morning. Another of the team has a contact in the FBI to use as a go-between, and to initiate an investigation when we have proof. They'll be waiting to hear from us when we've completed today's operation. He broke off as Rebecca walked into the room and all eyes turned to her. Karen had pulled a few extra chairs into the room and sat in one of them next to a low, glass-topped coffee table. There were two men sitting on the couch across from where David stood. David smiled at her as both men got up, stepping forward to be introduced. 
Rebecca, this is Steve Lopez. Steve is our resident computer genius and our best marksman. Steve grinned, an aw shuck smile that suited his boyish features perfectly as he shook her hand, his teeth white against his natural deep tan colouring. He had dark, quick eyes and black hair and was only a few inches taller than her, but not much older either. His gaze was friendly and direct, and in spite of the circumstances, Rebecca found herself wishing that she'd at least run a brush through her hair before coming out of the bathroom. Simply put, he was hot. And this is John Andrews, our communications specialist and field scout. John's skin was a deep mahogany brown, and he didn't have a beard, but he reminded her of Barry nonetheless. He was massively built, his six-foot frame bulging with tightly packed muscle. He grinned brightly at her, his smile dazzling white. This is Rebecca Chambers, biochemist and field medic for Raccoon City Stars, David said. John let go of her hand, still smiling. Biochemist? Damn. How old are you? Rebecca smiled back, catching the glint of humor in his eyes. Eighteen and three quarters. John laughed a deep, throaty chuckle as he sat back down. He glanced at Steve, then back at her. You better watch out for Lopez, then, he said, then dropped his voice to a mock whisper. He just turned twenty-two, and he's single. Knock it off, Steve growled, his cheeks flushing. He looked at her, shaking his head. You'll have to excuse John. He thinks he's got a sense of humor, and nobody can talk him out of it. Your mother thinks I'm funny, John shot back, and before Steve could respond, David held up a hand. That's enough, he said mildly. We only have a few hours to organize if we mean to do this today. Let's get started, shall we? Steve and John's banter had been a welcome break from her tension, making her feel like one of the team almost instantly, but she was also glad to see the serious, intent look on all of their faces as they turned their attention to David, watching him pull out Trent's information and lay it on the table. It was good to know that they were pros. But will it matter? Her mind whispered softly. The stars in Raccoon were professionals too, and even knowing the kind of research Umbrella's been doing, will it make any difference at all? What if the virus mutated and is still infectious? What if the place is crawling with tyrants or something worse? Rebecca had no answer for the insistent whisper. She focused on David instead silently telling herself that her anxieties wouldn't get in the way of her doing her job, and that her second mission wouldn't be her last. For Rebecca's sake, David started the briefing as he would have with an entirely new team. As bright as she was, and with her previous experience at an umbrella facility, he didn't want her to hold back for fear of speaking out of turn. Our objective is to get into the compound collect evidence on Umbrella and their research, and get out again with as little trouble as possible. I'll go over every step thoroughly, and if any of you have questions or ideas about how to proceed, no matter how trifling, I want to hear them. Understood? There were nods all around. David continued, comfortable that his point was made. We've already discussed a few of the possibilities as to what may happen, and you've all read the articles. I submit that we're dealing once again with some kind of accident. Umbrellas put a lot of effort into covering up the problem in Raccoon City, and while we could assume that they've been abducting or killing fishermen who've wandered across their territory, it seems unlikely that they'd want to draw that kind of attention to themselves. Why has an umbrella sent in anyone to clean it up? John asked. David shook his head. Who's to say why they haven't? We may find that they've already cleared the site of evidence, in which case we group together with the raccoon people and our own contacts and start over. Again, everyone nodded. He didn't bother stating the obvious, that the virus could still be contagious. They all knew that it was a possibility, though he planned to have Rebecca address the matter before the briefing was through. David looked down at the map and sighed inwardly before moving on to the next point. Point of entry, he said. 
if this were an open assault, we would go in by helicopter or just hop the fence. But if there are still people there and we trigger an alarm, it's over before we even start. Since we don't want to risk discovery, our best option is to go in by boat. We can use one of the rafts from the tanker operation last year. Karen piped up, frowning slightly. Wouldn't they have an alarm for the pier? David touched the map, putting his finger just below the notched line of the fence, south of the compound. Actually, I don't recommend using the pier at all. If we go in here, we go past the pier. He traced upward, running the length of the cove. We can get a look at the layout of the entire compound and hide the raft in one of the caves beneath the lighthouse. According to what I read, there's a natural path from the base of the cliff to the lighthouse itself. If the path has been blocked, we'll backtrack and come up with an alternate route. Won't the raft attract attention if anyone's outside watching? Rebecca asked. David shook his head. The Exeter Stars had used the rafts the previous summer to approach an oil tanker that had been hijacked by terrorists who had threatened to spill the cargo unless their demands were met. It had been a night operation. It's black and has an underwater motor. If we go in just past dusk, we should be invisible. The other benefit to this approach is that if the facility looks unhealthy, we can abort until a later time. He waited as they thought it over not wanting to rush them. They were good soldiers, his team, but this was a volunteer assignment. If any one of them had serious doubts, it was better to address them now. Besides which, he was open to other suggestions. His gaze fell across Rebecca's youthful face, taking in the steady willingness of a good star's operative in the quick brown eyes, the thoughtful consideration of his plan. He was beginning to like her, for more than just her usefulness to the mission. There was a kind of -of matter-of-fact openness about her that appealed to him, particularly with all of his recent turmoil over emotional awkwardness. She seemed quite comfortable with herself. David pushed the thoughts aside, suddenly realising how much stress he'd been under, how tired he continued to be. His focus was suffering for it. Keep it together, man. This isn't the time to wander. On to specifics he said. Once we get inside, we move in a staggered line through the compound, sticking to the shadows. John will take point with Karen at his back, scouting the area for the lab and looking for some idea as to what's happened. Steve and Rebecca will follow and I'll bring up the rear. When we find the lab, we go in together. Rebecca will know what to look for in terms of materials and if they have a computer system still running, Steve can get into the files. The rest of us will provide cover. Once we retrieve the information, we get back out the way we came. He picked up the poem that Trent had given him, tapping it with his other hand. One of Rebecca's teammates has already had dealings with Mr. Trent. She thinks this might be relevant to what we need to find, so I want all of you to take another look before we go in. It may be important. So, can we trust him? Karen asked. This Trent's okay? David frowned, not sure how to answer. It seems that, for whatever reason, he's on our side in all of this, he said slowly. And Rebecca recognized one of the names on the list, as a man who has worked with viruses before. The information looked solid. It wasn't a straight answer, but it would have to do. Any idea on what the chances are that we'll contract the virus? Steve asked quietly. David tilted his head toward Rebecca. If you could give us some insight about what we may see, perhaps a bit of background. She nodded, turning toward the rest of the team. I can't tell you exactly what we're dealing with. When our team got kicked off the case, I lost access to the tissue and saliva samples, so I didn't get to run any tests. But from looking at the effects, it's pretty obvious that the T-virus is a mutagen, altering the host's chromosome structure on a cellular level. It's an interspecies infective capable of amplifying in plants, mammals, birds, reptiles, you name it. In some creatures, it promotes incredible growth. In all of them, violent behavior. From some of the reports we came across at the estate, I can tell you that it affects brain chemistry at least in humans. 
inducing something like a, a schizophrenic psychosis through extremely high levels of D2 receptors. It also inhibits pain. The human victims we came across hardly reacted to gunshot wounds, and though they were decaying physically, they didn't seem to feel it. The young chemist paused, perhaps remembering. She suddenly looked much older than her years. The spill at the estate looked like an airborne, but I don't think that's its designed or preferred form. The scientists were almost certainly injecting it in conjunction with genetic experimentation, and since none of us contracted it and it didn't spread, I don't think we have to worry about breathing it in. What we do have to watch for is contact with a host. And I mean any contact. I can't stress that enough. This thing is incredibly virulent once it enters the bloodstream. And even a single drop of blood from a host could hold hundreds of millions of virus particles. We need a fully equipped hot suite and a trained biohazard virologist to pin down its replication strategy for certain. But direct contact of any kind should be avoided at all costs. With any luck, they'll have died by now, or at least deteriorated past mobility. The humans, anyway. There was a moment of strained silence as they all considered the implications of what she'd told them. David could see that they were shaken and felt a bit shaken himself. Knowing that the virus was toxic wasn't the same thing as actually hearing the specifics. My God. What were those people thinking? How could they live with themselves, deliberately infecting anything with something like that? On the tail of that thought, another occurred to him. How would he live with himself if one of his team contracted the virus? He'd led missions before, in which people under his command had been hurt. And twice before he'd made captain, he'd been on operations in which stars had been killed but taking a team into an area on his own initiative, where a silent, terrible disease could infect them, where they could die at the claws of some inhuman monster. It would be on my head. This isn't an authorised mission. The responsibility stops with me. Can I truly ask them to do this? Well, it pretty much sounds like a shit job, John said finally. And if we want to get there on time, we'd better head out soon. He smiled at David, an uncharacteristically subdued one, but a smile all the same. You know me, I love a good fight. And somebody's got to stop those assholes from spreading this stuff around, right? Steve and Karen were both nodding, their faces as set and determined as John's. And, even knowing what they would encounter, Rebecca had made her decision back in Raccoon. David felt a sudden rush of emotion for all of them, a strange, uncomfortable mix of pride and fear and warmth that he wasn't sure what to do with. After a few seconds of uncertain silence, he nodded briskly, glancing at his watch. It would take them a few hours to get to the launch site. Right, he said. We'd best get to storage and load up. We can go through the rest of it on our way. As they stood to leave, David reminded himself that they were doing this because it was necessary, that each of them had made up their own mind to participate in the dangerous operation. They knew the risks. And he also knew that if anything went wrong, that knowledge would be cold comfort indeed. Karen sat in the back of the van and loaded clips the words of the mysterious message repeating through her thoughts as she thumbed the 9mm rounds into each magazine. Amon's message received. Blue series. Enter answer for key. Letters and numbers reverse. Time rainbow. Don't count. Blue to access. She finished another clip and set it aside with the others, absently wiping her oily fingers on the leg of her pants before picking up the next. A welcome breeze whispered through the muggy van, smelling of salt and summer-warmed sea. They pulled off the road south of the cove, finding a clear patch to set up not a quarter mile from the water's edge. Outside, the sun was setting, 
casting long shadows across the dusty ground. The not-so-distant sound of soft waves against the shore was soothing, a white noise background to the low voices of the others as they worked. Steve and David were prepping the raft, while John checked out the motor. Rebecca was assembling a medical kit from the supplies they'd borrowed out of the star's equipment house. The letters and numbers. A code. Does it relate to time? Does counting relate to the sum of the lines or to something else? Her mind worked the riddle relentlessly, gnawing at the words the way a dog worries a bone. What did it mean? Were the lines connected to a single concept, or did each represent a separate aspect of a bigger puzzle? Had Amon sent the message, and if he worked for Umbrella, why? She finished the last clip and reached for a waterproof carry-all, refocusing herself to the task at hand. She knew that her thoughts would return to the strange little poem as soon as she completed her assigned detail. It was the way her mind worked. She just couldn't relax when presented with an ambiguity. There was always an answer, always, and finding it was just a matter of concentration, of taking the right steps in the right order. The semi-automatics were clean and ready, laying in a neat line next to the checked radio gear on the floor of the van. They weren't taking any weapons beside the star's issued Berettas, David insisting that they needed to travel light. Although Karen agreed, she was sorry they wouldn't be bringing in the assault rifles, which were equipped with night scopes. After hearing more of the details about the zombie-like creatures on their ride, she didn't know how comfortable she felt with just a handgun and a halogen flashlight. A minute, you're worried about this one. And have been since David broke the news. The facts are all out of order. The pieces don't fit the way they're supposed to. It was ironic that the reasons compelling her to crack this mystery were the same ones that made her so uneasy. Trent, the star's apparent collusion with Umbrella, the possibility of a biohazardous incident in her home state. Who had been bribed? What had happened at Caliban Cove? What would they uncover? What did the poem mean? Not enough data. Not yet. She always prided herself on her lack of imagination, on her ability to find the truth based on empirical evidence rather than wild, unsubstantiated intuition. It was the key to success in her field, and though she was aware that she sometimes came across as overly clinical, even cold, she accepted who she was, embracing the kind of peace that was found in knowing all of the facts. Whether it was examining blood spray patterns or measuring angles on an entry wound, there was a deep satisfaction for her in solving puzzles, in finding out not only why, but how. The unanswered questions about Caliban Cove were an affront to her careful thought processes. They went against her grain, smudging her very ordered sense of reality, and she knew that she wouldn't find relief until those questions were put to rest. She was finished with the weapons. She should check the utility belts again, make sure everything was locked down and ready, and then see if David had anything else for her to do. Karen hesitated, feeling a trickle of warm sweat slide down her back. No one was within sight of the open back door, and she'd already double-checked every flap and pocket on every belt. With a sudden rush of something like guilt, she reached into her vest pocket and pulled out her secret, comforted by the familiar weight of it in her hand. God, if the guys only knew, I'd never hear the end of it. It had been given to her by her father, a remnant of his service in World War II and one of the few items she had to remember him by. An ancient anti-personnel shrapnel grenade, called a pineapple because of its cross-hatched exterior. Carrying it was one of her few unpractical idiosyncrasies, one that made her feel a little silly. She'd worked hard to present herself as a thoroughly rational, intelligent woman, not prone to emotional sentimentality. And, in most respects, that was true. 
but the grenade was her rabbit's foot, and she never went on a mission without it. Besides, she had half convinced herself that it might come in handy one day. Yeah, keep telling yourself that. The stars have digitized anti-personnel grenades with timers, even flashbangs with computer chips. The pin on this relic probably couldn't be wrenched out with pliers. Karen, do you need any help? Startled, Karen looked up and into Rebecca's earnest young features, the girl leaning into the back of the van. Her quick gaze fell to the grenade, her eyes lighting up with sudden curiosity. I thought we weren't taking any explosives. Hey, is that a pineapple grenade? I've never actually seen one. Is it live? Karen quickly looked around, afraid that one of the team had overheard, then grinned sheepishly at the young biochemist, embarrassed by her own embarrassment. It's not like I got caught masturbating, for Christ's sake. She doesn't know me. Why the hell would she care if I'm superstitious? Shh, they'll hear us. Come here a sec, she said, and Rebecca obediently crawled into the van, a conspiratorial half-smile blooming on her face. In spite of herself, Karen was absurdly pleased by the young biochemist's discovery. In the seven years she'd been with stars, no one had ever found out, and she'd taken an instant liking to the girl. It is a pineapple, and we're not taking explosives in. You can't tell anyone, okay? I carry it for good luck. Rebecca raised her eyebrows. You carry a live grenade around for luck? Karen nodded, looking at her seriously. Yes, and if John or Steve found out, they'd ride me ragged. I know it's dumb, but it's a kind of secret. I don't think it's dumb. My friend Jill has a lucky hat. Rebecca reached up and touched her headband, a tied red bandana beneath mousy bangs. And I've been wearing this for a couple of weeks, practically. I was wearing it when we went into the Spencer facility. Her young face clouded slightly, and then she was smiling again, her light brown gaze direct and sincere. I won't say a word. Karen decided that she definitely liked her. She took the grenade back in her vest, nodding at the girl. I appreciate that. So, are we ready out there? Tiny lines of nervous strain appeared on Rebecca's face. Yeah, pretty much. John wants to run another check with the headsets, but other than that, everything's done. Karen nodded again, wishing she could say something to ease the girl's fear. There wasn't anything to say. Rebecca had dealt with Umbrella before, and any words that Karen might mouth would be hollow ones, might even seem patronizing. She felt some anxiety herself. She'd be a fool not to. But fear wasn't a state that she wore often or well. As with most missions, the overriding feeling she experienced was anticipation, a kind of cerebral hunger for the truth. Go ahead and hand out the weapons. I'll get the rest, Karen said finally. She could at least give her something to do. Rebecca helped her unload the equipment as the sun dipped lower in the heavy summer sky. The winds off the water grew colder and the first pale stars shimmered into view over the Atlantic. As twilight crept in, they moved down to the water in uneasy silence, loading their weapons, stretching, staring out at the black waters that eddied and swirled with secrets of their own. When the last of the daylight melted off the horizon, they were as ready as they were going to get. As John and David slipped the raft into the lapping darkness, Karen slipped on a black watch cap and patted the heavy lump inside her vest for luck, telling herself that she wouldn't need it. The truth was waiting. It was time to find out what was really going on. Okay, and our mission is a go. The main stars, guest starring Rebecca, are going to take on Caliban Cove and find some surprises that we know are waiting for them. I'm glad we're reaching this part because I am eager to get into the action of this book. So I'm just going to carry on and jump onto chapter seven. Steve and David climbed in, edging to the front of the six man raft as Karen and Rebecca followed. John hopped in last and, at David's signal, 
started the motor with the push of a button. It was as silent as David had promised, only a faint hum that was almost lost in the sound of gently moving water. Let's move, David said quietly. Rebecca took a deep breath and let it out slowly as they started north, heading for the cove. Nobody spoke as the shore slid by to their left, shadowy, jagged shapes in the pallid light of the rising moon, an immense and whispering void to their right. Port and starboard, her mind noted randomly, bow and stern. She searched the blackness for a sign that marked the beginning of the private territory, but couldn't make out much. It was a lot darker than she'd expected, and colder. The chill she felt was compounded by the knowledge that beneath them lay an infinite and alien world, teeming with cold-blooded life. Rebecca saw a flash of soft light as David raised a pair of NV binoculars to watch for movement on the shore. The infrared illuminator's glow spilled across his face for an instant before he adjusted their position, making his features strange and craggy. Now that they were actually doing it, actually on their way, she felt better than she had all day. Not relaxed by any means. The dread was still there. The fear of the unknown and for what they might encounter. But the feelings of helplessness, the mind-numbing anxiety she'd lived with since the incident in Raccoon, had eased, giving way to hope. We're doing something taking the offensive instead of waiting for them to get us. I see the fence, David said softly, his face a pale smudge in the bobbing dark. We'll pass the dark next, maybe see the buildings as the land slopes up to the lighthouse, to the caves. Water slopped at the raft, the sound of muted waves growing as the small craft rocked and shuddered. Rebecca felt her heart speed up. While she liked looking at the ocean, she wasn't all that thrilled to be out in it. As a kid, she'd seen Jaws one time too many. She kept her focus on the shore, trying to judge how close they were, and felt as much as saw the land open up as the tiny raft slipped through the lapping waves. Maybe twenty metres away, the towering shadows of trees gave way to a clearing. She could hear water dashing lightly against the rocky shore, sense flat, open space on both sides of them now. They had reached the compound. There's the dock, David said. John, veer starboard, two o'clock. Rebecca could just make out the faint, man-made shape of the pier ahead of them, a dark line shifting on the water. There was the hollow, lonely squeak of metal rubbing wood the small dock raised and straining at its pilings. There were no boats that she could see. As the pier slipped past, Rebecca squinted into the darkness beyond. She could just make out the blocky outline of a structure behind the floating wood, what had to be a boathouse or a marina for the facility. She couldn't see any of the other buildings from Trent's map. There were six more besides the lighthouse, five of them spaced evenly along the cove, set into two lines that paralleled the shore, three in front, two behind. The sixth structure was directly in back of the lighthouse, and they were all hoping that it was the lab. They'd be able to get what they needed without going through the whole compound. Boathouse is wood. The others look like concrete. I don't... Wait! David's whisper became urgent. Somebody. Two. Three people. They just went behind one of the buildings. Rebecca felt a strange relief flood through her. Relief and disappointment and sudden confusion. If there were people, maybe the T-virus hadn't been unleashed. But that meant that the buildings would be occupied, the grounds patrolled, making a covert operation impossible. Then why is it so dark? And why does it feel so dead here? So empty? Do we abort? Karen whispered, and before David could respond, Steve gasped, a sharp intake of air that froze Rebecca's blood, her thoughts fluttering wildly in a spasm of primal fear. Three o'clock! Big! Oh, 
Jesus, it's huge! Bam! The raft was hit, heaved up and over in a fountain of churning blackness. Rebecca saw a flash of sky, smelled cold and rotting slime, and was plunged, splashing into the turbulent dark waters of the sea. Water enveloped him, the icy, stinging salt burning David's eyes and nose as he flailed desperately, lost and breathless. Where is it? He'd seen it, an immense and pebbled plain of flesh surging up from the black at the second of impact. The surface pulled at him and he kicked against the dragging depths, terrified. His head broke through to air and an ominous quiet. The team, where's... David whirled around, gasping, heard a spluttering cough to his left. Get to shore, he panted, turning in a circle, trying to find their position. To find the creatures, cursing himself for a fool. Missing fishermen haunted waters, stupid, stupid. The raft was ten metres behind him, upside down, disturbed water splashing at its sides. The force of the attack had thrown them clear, actually knocking them closer to land. He saw two bobbing shapes, faces between him and the shore, heard more splashing as another joined them. He couldn't see the unnatural thing that had hit the raft, but expected to feel the bite any second, the cold puncture of dagger teeth tearing him to pieces. Get to shore, he called again, his heart thundering, his legs heavy and vulnerable, kicking, obvious. Can't go in. Three. Where's four? David! John's terrified shout from behind the floating raft. Here, John, this way, come this way, follow my voice. John started toward him as David tread water, propelling himself backward toward the rocky beach and shouting all the while. He saw the top of John's head appear, saw his arms pumping frantically through the murky water. Follow me! I'm over here! We have to get to- A giant, pale shadow rose up smoothly behind the soldier, at least three metres across, rounded and dripping and impossible. Time jerked to a crawl, the events unfolding in front of him in a slow-motion dream. David saw thick, tapering tentacles on either side near the top of the rising shadow, saw a rounded slash in the corpse-coloured sickness. Not tentacles, feelers. And realised that he was seeing the underbelly of a monstrous animal that couldn't possibly exist. A bottom feeder as big as a house. The black slash of its mouth hissed open, revealing clusters of peg-like, grinding teeth, each the size of a man's fist. When it came down, John would be swallowed up by the massive jaws, or crushed, or ploughed into the icy deep, a drowning meal for the creature. In the instant it took him to absorb the facts, he was already screaming, Dive! Dive! Time skipped forward, and the beast was falling forward, arching over its long, thick serpent's body, dwarfing the raft, its shadow enveloping the frantic swimmer. David caught a glimpse of bulbous, rolling eyes the size of beach balls, and it crashed down, sending explosive plumes of water high into the air blotting out the stars in sheets of foaming spray. Before David could draw breath, a tremendous wave knocked into him, driving him violently backward through the bubbling darkness. There was a rushing movement, a sense of helpless speed, as he struggled against the force that tore at his limbs, struggled to find air in the sweeping torrent. Kicking wildly, he surged upward through the liquid veil, felt cold air slap at his skin, and warm, human hands yanking at his shoulders. 
He inhaled convulsively as his boots scraped against rock and Karen's ragged voice spoke behind him. Got him! Staggering against the slimy rocks, David let himself be dragged backward until he found his balance and could turn around. Wet figures were reaching out. Steve and Rebecca. Oh my God, John! I'm okay, David gasped. Stumbling forward, his knees cracking numbly against larger rocks that his blurred gaze denied him from seeing. John, d does anyone see him? Nobody answered. He blinked away, salt, reeling around to face the splashing darkness, the settling waves slapping at their feet. John! He called as loud as he dared, searching, seeing nothing at all. His heart was as cold as his body, as heaven as the sodden weight of his Kevlar vest. No life jackets would have seen him by now. He called again, hope dwindling. John! A choking, strangled voice from the rocks to the left. What? David sagged in relief, taking a deep breath as John's dripping figure staggered out of the shadows. Steve lunged forward, grabbing the taller man's arm and helping him lean against the rocks. I dove, John rasped out. David turned and looked up, past the sliver of pebble, boulder-strewn beach, to the darkness of the compound. They were at the bottom of a short, angled drop in plain sight. The shock of the monstrous fish, if it could be called that, was suddenly unimportant in the light of that realisation. They were out of the water now. Have they heard us? Seen? We won't make the caves now. Can't stay here. The marina, he breathed, turning south. Quickly! The team stumbled past him, Karen taking the lead, the others following close. No one seemed seriously injured, a miracle all of its own. David jogged after John, assessing the situation as his aching legs carried him through the rocky dark. Get to cover, bar the door, regroup, get to the fence. The ground rose steeply in front of them, the pier looming into view ahead. As they clambered up over rocks, David heard a muffled clatter of metal, saw Rebecca hugging the black, dripping shape of the ammo pack to her chest. He felt a wisp of new hope for their chances. If they could just make it inside, somewhere safe. The building was ahead on their right, silent and dark. A closed door facing the wooden dock. There was no way to know if it was empty, and though barely ten metres away, the distance was open and flat, weathered planking, not even a pebble to block them from view. No choice. Stay low, he whispered and then they were crouching their way to the structure, Karen reaching the door first, pushing it open. No light spilled out, no alarm sounded. Steve and Rebecca piled in behind her, then John, then David, stumbling into the dark, closing the wooden door after him with a wet, cold shoulder. Stop where you are, he said softly, fumbling for the halogen torch on his belt. Besides the gulping breaths of his team, the room was still, but there was a horrid smell in the close air, a fading stench of something long dead. The thin beam of light cut through the black, revealing a large and mostly empty windowless room. Ropes and life preservers hung from wooden pegs. A workbench ran the length of one wall. A few saw horses cluttered shelves. My God! The light froze on the room's other door, directly across from the one they'd entered. The narrow beam played across the source of the smell, highlighting bare bone and a tattered, oily-stained lab coat. Dried strings of muscle dripped in streamers from a grinning face. A corpse had been nailed to the door, one hand fixed in a welcoming wave. From the look, it had been dead for weeks. Steve felt his gorge rise into his throat. He swallowed it down, looking away, 
but the grotesque image was already fixed in his mind. The eyeless face and peeling tissue, the carefully splayed fingers pinned into place. Jesus, is that some kind of joke? Steve felt dizzy. Still out of breath from the nightmarish swim, the sloshing climb over the rocks, the horror of the umbrella sea monster, the dried, sour smell of rot wasn't helping. For a few seconds, nobody spoke. Then, David cupped one hand over the light and started talking, his voice low but amazingly even. Check your belts and drop your clips. I want status now. Injuries, then equipment. Take a deep breath, everyone. John? John's solemn voice rumbled through the shadows to Steve's left, accompanied by sounds of wet, fumbling movement. Karen and Rebecca were to his right, David still by the door. I got some fish slime on me, but I'm okay. I got my weapon, but my light's gone. So are my radios. Rebecca? Her voice was wavering, but quick. I'm fine. Um, my weapon's here, and the flashlight. The med kit. Oh, and I've got the ammo. Steve checked himself out as she spoke, unholstering his Beretta and ejecting the wet mag, slipping it into a pocket. There was an empty spot on his belt where his light should have been. Steve? Yeah, no injuries. Weapon, but no light. Karen? Same. David's fingers shifted over the muted beam, allowing a shallow glow to spill into the room. No one's hurt, and we're still armed. Things could be a lot worse. Rebecca, pass out the clips, please. The fence can't be more than fifty metres south from here, and there are enough trees for cover, provided no one has seen us yet. This operation is called. We are getting out of here. Steve accepted three loaded magazines from Rebecca, nodding his thanks. He slapped one into the semi, chambering around automatically. Great, fine, let's blow. That insane creature nearly eating us? Now Mr. Death dropping a casual wave like he was put here to say hello? Steve wasn't easily frightened, but he knew a bad situation when he saw it. He admired the stars deeply, had wanted to go in on the operation to help make things right but with their boat gone and the initial plan shot to shit, Nailing Umbrella could wait. David stepped closer to the decomposed figure, a look of disgust curling his fingers in the shadowy orange glow of the light. Karen, Rebecca, come take a look at this. John, take Rebecca's torch. You and Steve see if you can find anything useful. Rebecca handed her flashlight to John, who nodded at Steve. The two men walked to one end of the long workbench, the soft voices of the others carrying across the still air. The T-virus didn't do this, Rebecca said. Pattern of decay's all wrong. Silence. Then Karen spoke. See that? David, give me the light for a sec. John hooded their flashlight with one large hand, playing the beams across the dirty planks of the counter. A broken office mug, a pile of greasy nuts and bolts on top of a laminated tide chart, an electric screwdriver, dusty and dented, a couple of bits on a stained rag. Nothing. There's nothing here. We should get out before someone comes looking. John opened a drawer and rummaged through it while Steve tried to make out what was on an overhead shelf. Behind them, Karen spoke again. He wasn't dead when they nailed him up, though. I'd say he was close. Definitely unconscious. There's no smearing, suggesting he didn't struggle, and there are slide marks, uh, here and here. I'd say he was shot by the back door and dragged over. John had finished digging through the drawer, and they moved on, boots squelching against the wood floor. A set of socket wrenches, a cheap radio, a crumpled paper bag next to a pencil nub. Something snagged at Steve's thoughts, and he stopped, looking at the paper bag. The pencil. He picked up the crunched ball, smoothing out the wrinkles and turning it over. There were several lines written near the bottom, scrawled and jerky. Hey, we found something. 
John called quietly, shining the light over the writing as the others hurried over. Steve read it aloud, squinting at the faintly penciled words under the wobbling beam. There was no punctuation. He did his best to work out the pauses as he went. July 20. Food was drugged. I'm sick. I hid the material for you. Sent data. Boats are sunk. And he let the... Steve frowned, unable to make out the word. Try... Try squads? Boats are sunk, and he let the try squads out. Dark now. They'll come. I think he killed the rest. Stop him. God knows what he means to do. Destroy the lab. Find Krista. Tell her, I'm sorry. Lyle is sorry. I wish... There was nothing more. Aman's message, Karen said softly. Lyle Aman. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who was hanging on the door. The sagging, seeping Mr. Death had an identity now, for what it was worth. And the message that Trent had given to David was so weird because the poor guy had apparently been doped up when he sent it. Nice to put a face to the name, huh? John cracked, but not even he smiled. The desperate little note had an ominous ring to it, with or without the brutal murder to back it up. What's a tri-squad? Who's he? Maybe we should look around a little more, Rebecca began hesitantly, but David was shaking his head. I think it's best if we leave this for now. We'll... He broke off as heavy, plodding footsteps sounded across the wood deck, just outside the door they'd come through. Everyone froze, listening. More than one set, and whoever they were, they were making no effort to hide their approach. They stopped at the door and stayed there. No rattling knob, no crashing kick, no other sound. Waiting. David circled one finger in the air, pointed to Karen, and then to the other door, hung with the grisly remains of Lyle Amon. The signal to move out, Karen first. They edged toward the grinning corpse, Steve wincing at every shifting creak they created, breathing through his mouth to avoid inhaling the stench. And, as Karen pushed the door open, the silence was shattered by the rattle of automatic fire coming from in front of them, to the left, coming from the direction of their escape. Oh dear, it looks like the stars might have gone from the frying pan and into the fire. The automatic weapons fire, that is. So glad to now be into a bit more of the action, to start seeing some monsters, the giant thing in the water was quite fun, and a very good moment of tension to have that very quiet, stealthy moment, creeping up, thinking that they're all cool, and then suddenly having it dashed by this odd Resident Evil version of Moby Dick. And though the stars haven't necessarily seen zombies yet, we know from the earlier part of the audiobook that those tri-squads are indeed T-Virus undead, if a bit modified. So this is where I'd love to know if you're listening to both this audiobook and our audiobook of Star Wars Death Troopers. I'd be interested to know how you feel the two versions of zombies compare. And in Death Troopers, they do seem to be slightly more mindful than your usual shuffling Walking Dead style zombie, just like they are here in Caliban Cove. Do you guys suspect that the ones in Death Troopers will also be able to use weapons and tools like the undead we're seeing here in Caliban Cove? I'd like to know. Not too many comments on these Resident Evil books, so that does mean that we can move on to our chapters fairly quickly. So here is Chapter 8, taking off just where we left. Karen jumped back as bullets cracked into the door. Chunks of rotten flesh spattered up from Amon's body. The corpse danced and waved in a shuddering, jerking rhythm of macabre motion. David snatched at the coat of the dead man and yanked, 
but the door was pinned open by the clattering fire, and whoever was shooting was coming closer. The explosive shots louder, the splinters of flesh and wood pelting them with greater force. They were trapped, both exits blocked. Rebecca clutched her Beretta in one shaking hand, waiting for a signal from David. He pointed roughly northwest into the compound, shouting to be heard over the whining, spitting clatter of the automatic fire. Rebecca! Other door! John! Karen! Next building secure! Steve! We cover! Go! As one, Steve and David leapt out and started to fire the booming rounds punctuating the lighter hail of deadly ammo. John and Karen charged out at full run, were instantly swallowed up by the shadows. Rebecca spun and trained her weapon on the back door, her heart pounding in her throat. The walls trembled and shook. Die! Jesus, why won't they die? Steve screamed behind her, a strain of disbelief and terror in his voice that made her blood run cold. Zombies? Without looking away from the rectangle of dark wood, Rebecca shouted as loud as she could, her voice cracking over the relentless spray of the automatics. Headshots! Aim for the head! There was no way to know if they'd heard her. The rifle, or rifles, kept pounding, approaching. Her thoughts raced to understand images of the T-virus victims flitting through her mind. They'd been mindless, slow, inhuman, and accidental. Not on purpose. Not with purpose. Rebecca, let's go. There was still the sound of an automatic rifle firing, but the boathouse no longer shook from the impact of its force. She shot a glance back, saw Steve still shooting at something, saw David motioning her to move. She sidled for the open door, catching a sickening up-close look at the bullet-riddled corpse still hanging there. The head had caved in like a rotting pumpkin, teeth shattered, gummy flecks of tissue radiating out from behind the skull. The waving hand was no longer connected to the rotting arm. The radius and ulna blown away. It dangled there like some obscene decoration, beckoning. Steve fired once more and the auto's clatter ceased. He raised the weapon, his eyes wide and shocked as he opened his mouth to say something and the back door crashed open, bullets flying through the dark in a blaze of orange fire. David pushed her roughly through the front, and she ran, the responding crack of 9 millimeter rounds resonating behind her. Get to the building! Get to cover! She sprinted through the shadows, her wet shoes thumping across packed, rocky dirt, her searching gaze finding the outline of a massive, concrete block and the spindly trees that surrounded it in the darkness ahead. Here! She veered toward the call, saw John's muscular form silhouetted by pale starlight at the corner of the building. As she neared him, she saw the open door, Karen standing in the entryway with her weapon trained back toward the boathouse. Bullets still sang through the shadows. Get in! Karen shouted, Stepping out of the way, and Rebecca ran past her, not slowing until she was inside. She fell into a table in the pitch black, cracking one hip painfully against the edge. Turning, she saw Karen firing, heard John yelling, Come on! Come on! And Steve pounded through the door, gasping. He pulled to a stop before crashing into her, one hand clutching his chest. Rebecca moved to the door and grasped the cool thickness, her mind absently registering that the material was steel as David hurtled through, shouting, Karen! John! Karen backed into the darkness, weapon still raised. There were three more sharp reports from a Beretta, and then John slipped inside, his jaw clenched, his nostrils flaring. Rebecca slammed the door, her fingers finding a deadbolt switch. The soft snick of the lock was barely audible against the ringing in her ears. Outside, 
the bullets stopped. There were no shouts between the attackers, no alarms, no barking of dogs or screaming of wounded. The sudden silence was total, broken only by the deep, shuddering breathing in the warm and muggy darkness. A halogen beam flickered on, revealing the shocked faces of the team as David shone it around their retreat. A mid-sized room, crowded with desks and computer equipment. There were no windows. Did you see that? Steve gasped, addressing no one in particular. God, they wouldn't go down. Did you see that? Nobody answered, and though they were out of immediate danger, Rebecca didn't feel her adrenaline slowing didn't feel her heart settling back to anything approaching normal. It seemed that Umbrella had found a new application for the T-virus. And like it or not, we're going to have to deal with the consequences. They were trapped in Caliban Cove, and in this facility, the creatures had guns. David took a final deep breath and exhaled it heavily flashing the torch's light toward the door. I'd say we've been spotted, he said, hoping that he didn't sound as despairing as he felt. Might as well see what we've gotten into. Rebecca, would you turn on the lights? She flipped the wall switch and the room snapped into blinding brilliance, overhead fluorescent pulsing to life. Blinking against the sudden glare, David surveyed the team saw that Steve had one hand pressed to his chest. Are you hit? Vest stopped it, he said, but he seemed more out of breath than the others, his face paler than it should have been. Rebecca glanced at David with a questioning gaze. He nodded at her. Doesn't appear that we have anywhere else to go. Check him out. Anyone else? Nobody answered as Rebecca stepped up to Steve, motioning for him to take off the vest. David turned and looked around the room, measuring it against the memory of Trent's map and what little he'd seen from outside. There were a half a dozen cheap metal desks, each with a computer and bits of clutter on top. The cement walls were undecorated and plain. There was another door on the west wall that had to lead deeper into the building. Karen! Secure that, he said. They could check out the rest of the site once they decided what to do. Once you've decided, Captain, perhaps you'd like to send them out for a swim. Can't be any worse than what you've already managed. David ignored the inner voice, perfectly aware of how badly he'd underestimated the situation. The team didn't need to see him wallow in self-doubt. It wouldn't help anything. The question was... What now? Let's talk, he said. It doesn't look like we're facing an accident after all. What did the notes say? The food was drugged, and something about a he killing the others. Is it possible that we're not looking at a T-virus spill? Rebecca looked up from her examination of Steve's chest, the computer expert sitting on one of the desks in front of her. Steve winced as Rebecca's fingers circled the darkening bruise on his right pectoral. She smiled guiltily at him, shaking her head. You're okay. Nothing's broken. She turned back to David, the smile fading away. Yeah, if there'd been a release, that guy on the door, Haman, would have been affected. But the Tri-Squads, if they're the result of experiments with the T-Virus, they'd have rotted away by now. It's been over three weeks since he wrote that note. We should be looking at piles of mush. Either it's a different virus, or someone's been taking care of them. Enzyme upkeep, maybe. Uh, Some kind of refrigeration. David nodded slowly, following her reasoning. And if that someone has gone mad and killed everyone, why bother? That corpse waving at us, Karen said thoughtfully and the creature or creatures in the cove. It's like he expected people to come. But didn't mean for us to get very far, John finished. The line from the note ran through David's mind, the words following the plea to stop him. God knows what he means to do. 
Steve had slipped his shirt back on, shivering from the damp cloth. So what do we do now? David didn't answer him, not sure what to say. He felt so drained, so exhausted and uncertain. I... Our options are to get out or go deeper, he said softly. Considering what's happened so far, I don't feel comfortable making that call. What do you want to do? David looked warily from face to face, expecting to see anger and disdain. He let them down led them into a perilous situation without a contingency plan, all because he couldn't stand to see the stars tarnished, and now that they were trapped, he didn't know what to do. The expressions they wore as a group were thoughtful and intent. He was surprised to see Karen actually smile, and when she spoke, her tone was brightly eager. Since you're asking, I want to figure this out. I want to know what happened here. Rebecca was nodding. Yeah, me too. And I still want to get a look at the T-virus. I want to pick off a few more of those triboys, John said, grinning. Man, zombies with M-16s? Night of the living death squad. Steve sighed, pushing his wet bangs off his forehead. Might as well keep looking. Going back out isn't exactly safe. It's not the way I would have liked, but getting dirt and umbrella was the original plan. Yeah, I want to nail those bastards. David smiled, feeling properly embarrassed at himself. He hadn't just underestimated the situation. He'd sorely underestimated his team. What do you want? Rebecca asked suddenly. Really? The question surprised him anew. Not because she'd asked, but because, suddenly, he didn't have an answer. He thought about the stars about his obsession with his career and what it had already cost them. All he'd wanted for days was to feel as though his life's work had been meaningful, that it hadn't been wasted, and he'd convinced himself that uncovering the treachery within the job would lay his mind at rest, as if rooting out the corruption would somehow prove that he wasn't worthless. I've worshipped at the altar of the organisation for so long. But isn't this the reason why? the real purpose? Here, in this room, on these faces. He studied her curious, sharp gaze, felt the rest of them watching him, waiting. I want for us to survive, he said finally, truthfully. I want for us to make it out of here. Amen to that, John muttered. David remembered what he'd told the raccoon team about each of them doing what they did best if they meant to succeed against Umbrella. He'd said it to get Chris's approval of his operation, but it was a truth that applied to all of them. Get to it, Captain. John, you and Karen take a look around the building, check the doors, be back in ten. Steve, boot up one of these computers, see if you can find a detailed layout of the grounds. Rebecca, we'll go through the desks. We want maps, data on tri-squads, T-virus, anything personal about the researchers that might tell us who's behind all this. David nodded at them, realising that he felt clearer and more balanced than he had in a long, long time. Let's do it, he said. To hell with the stars. They were going to take Umbrella down. Dr. Griffith might not have even noticed the security breach if it hadn't been for the MA-7s. It seemed that they were useful after all, though not in the way they'd been intended. He'd spent most of the day in the lab, dreamily pondering the pressurised canisters standing by the entrance, the shining steel glittering seductively in the soft light. Once he'd made the decision to let the virus go, he'd realised that there was really nothing else he needed to do. The hours had flown by. Each glance at the clock had been a surprise, though not an unpleasant one. He'd be the first, after all, the first convert to the new way of the world. With that in front of him, the only task with which he needed to concern himself was getting the canisters up to the lighthouse. And... With the doctors waiting silently, patiently by, 
Even that was taken care of. Just before dawn, he give them their final instructions, and then proudly lead the human species into the light, into the miracle of peace. It had been the thought of the MA7s that had finally drawn him out into the caves, the only concern he hadn't already dismissed as trivial. He'd already made a mistake with the Leviathans. Once he'd taken over the facility, he lowered the cove gates on impulse, wanting them to be as free as he felt. It wasn't until the next day that he realised Umbrella might find out and come looking, effectively putting an end to his plans. He'd continued to send in weekly reports to keep up appearances, but there was no good explanation for the escapes of the four creatures. It had been sheer luck that the Leviathans had returned on their own. The MA7s were a different matter entirely, of course. They were too violent, too unpredictable to be let out. But letting them starve to death in their cage didn't seem right, particularly not when they too would enjoy the effects of his gift. It wasn't their choice to exist as creatures of destruction, even to exist at all. And since he'd played a small role in their creation, he felt a responsibility to do something for them. He'd stood in front of the outer gate for quite some time, considering the problem as all five of the animals hurled themselves repeatedly at the heavy steel mesh, their strange, mournful howls echoing through the damp and winding caves. There was a manual lock release near the enclosure, another in the lab, but there was no way to lose them from the lighthouse, and he certainly couldn't let them out before he got to safety. He could send one of the doctors to do it, but the Sevens had a much slower metabolism than a human's, and there was a risk that they would get to him before they made the change. A month before his takeover of the compound, Dr. Chin and two of her vet techs had made the mistake of trying to tend to one of the sick ones. It was a bad way to die and although he'd be oblivious to the pain once he'd made the transition, he meant to stay with the new world for as long as possible. Griffith had finally decided that euthanasia was the only reasonable choice. It was a reluctant decision, but he could see no alternative. Although the lab was well stocked, poisons weren't his forte, so he decided to look up the information on the mainframe. And, there, in the cold comfort of the sealed laboratory, he discovered that his sanctuary had been invaded. He sat in front of the computer in a kind of shock, staring at the blinking cursor that indicated system use in one of the bunkers. There was no chance that it was a mistake. Except for the lab terminals, the rest of the compound had been powered down weeks ago. Umbrella had come. The first emotion to break through his stunned astonishment was rage. A sweeping, red-hot fury that tore away all reason, descending over him like a blinding fire. For a few moments, he was lost, his body taken over by the primal force, grasping and rending, tearing at the useless, meaningless things that fell beneath his burning fingers. They will not, will not stop me, will not. When his hands touched the cool metal of the canisters, the fire turned to ash. The smooth silver tanks were like a splash of reason, bringing him back to himself. His control returned as abruptly as it had gone, leaving him breathless and sweating. My creation, my work. Blinking, gasping, he found himself standing in a sea of ripped papers, broken glass and torn circuitry. He managed to destroy the computer, the bearer of the bad news, in pieces on the floor. On another day, he might have been ashamed of the hysterical tantrum, but on this, the eve of his greatness, he allowed that the rage had been justified. Justified, perhaps, but pointless. How will you keep them from stopping you? 
You can't release the strain here, and you can't risk taking it outside. Not now. What are their plans? How much do they know? He could find out easily enough. There were still two other terminals in the lab, and he walked quickly to one of them, glancing at the mute doctors sitting quietly by the airlock. If they'd even noticed his rampage, they gave no sign. He felt a small rush of hatred for them, for creating the useless tri-squads. The unstoppable guards had failed him now that he needed them most. He sat down and turned on the monitor, impatiently waiting for the spinning umbrella of the company logo to disappear. The security network for the compound system was based in the lab. He'd be able to see what the intruders were seeking without alerting them to his presence. If he could remember how to access the information, he tapped several keys, waited, then typed in his clearance number. After the briefest of pauses, lines of glowing green data spilled across the screen. He'd done it. Seek, find, locate. He frowned at the information, wondering why the hell anyone from Umbrella would be searching for the laboratory. And, for that matter, why they'd try looking for that information in the mainframe at all. The system designers weren't idiots. There was nothing about the layout of the facility in the files. And Umbrella would know it. Which means... Relief coursed through him. Cool and pure relief, so great that he laughed out loud. He suddenly felt quite silly at his childish reaction to the breach. The searcher wasn't from Umbrella, and that changed everything. Even if they managed to find the lab, an unlikely proposition at best considering its location, they wouldn't be able to gain entry without a keycard, and Griffith had destroyed all of them. Except for Amans. His was never found. Griffith froze, then shook his head, a nervous smile on his face. No, he'd search practically everywhere for the missing card. What were the chances that an interloper would stumble across it? And what were the chances that they'd make it past the tri-squads, hmm? And what was Lyle up to during those hours where you couldn't find him? What if he did get a message out? You only checked for transmissions to Umbrella. What if he contacted someone else? Even as the dreadful, impossible thought occurred to him, the computer began to spit out information on the logic skills tests, the socio-psychological series tests that Amon had designed. Griffith felt his control slipping again. He clenched his hands into fists, refusing to give in. There was too much at stake. He couldn't afford to let his emotions take over. Not now. He had to think. I'm a scientist, not a soldier. I don't even know how to shoot, to fight. I'd be useless in combat, totally unpredictable, uncontrollable. A slow grin spread across his features. Blood was seeping from his fists, from where his ragged fingernails had dug into the heels of his hands. But he felt no pain. His gaze wandered around the open, silent laboratory, resting briefly on the airlock. Then, to the blank, stupid faces of his doctors. To the cylinders of compressed air and virus. His miracle. And finally, to the controls for the mesh gate that led to the animal enclosure. Dr. Griffith's smile widened. Blood pattered to the floor. Let them come. And there we have it. Dr. Griffith is planning an even worse welcome for our guys at Stars. They've done well to survive this long and they've taken down some of the tri squads, but oh dear, these MA7s might just be a bit of a challenge for them. So if you want to find out what that challenge is like, then I suggest, my friends, that perhaps you subscribe. And certainly if you've subscribed, click that bell icon. By the way, did you know if you subscribe, you become one of the Knights of Fulcrum? Part of a cool little organization here of people who 
well, just hang out and listen to audiobooks together. One of our Knights of Fulcrum, Guardian Gunner, says, Can't wait for part three. Your voice really sells the story. Thanks very much, Guardian. I really do hope you enjoyed this video. And TJ Templar says, Sir Harry, a fantastic job. Feel guilty about not paying to listen. Check out the Dean Coots Frankenstein novels I think you will enjoy. Thank you so much for that recommendation. I've never had a look at those. I will have to try them out. But until I see you next time at part four, definitely hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, click on that bell icon so you know when all of our wonderful audiobooks and live podcasts come out. And remember, my friends, we are all Fulcrum.